Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar examining the major impacts of the recent tax reform law on individuals and businesses. I'm Fatima Iqbal, Senior Investment Strategist at Azad Asset Management. Here's a little bit more about me. I am an investment advisor and certified financial planner at Azad, and I'm joining you from Chicago. I'll also introduce our main speaker for today and then return to talk about retirement planning, and then we'll conclude and I'll also assist in the Q&A portion. Now on to our main speaker. We're delighted to have with us today Kay Lee, Tax Managing Director at BDO. Kay has more than 15 years of public accounting experience focusing on tax planning and compliance services for small to mid-sized privately held businesses, affiliated partners and shareholders, corporate executives, as well as high net worth individuals. And here's some more information about BDO as well. It's a multinational public accounting firm with presence in more than 160 countries worldwide. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to you, Kay. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Fatima. We'll circle back to you a little later in today's presentation when we talk about the importance of having qualified retirement plans. Hello, everyone. As you all know, the tax reform bill was signed into law on December 22, 2017. It was the most comprehensive update to the tax code since 1986. Most provisions went into effect starting January 1, 2018, but are set to sunset on December 31, 2025. Looking back, there were many speculations and predictions about the changes leading up to this date, which made tax planning discussions very challenging and interesting at best. Before we dive in, please note that this session is for general information purpose only, and it does not create CPA-client relationships. Also, I highly recommend consulting with your tax advisor for any specific topic you want to follow up on. Most of these cases, you have to run some numbers before understanding the impact of these changes to you. Our agenda for the next hour is broken into four sections. First, we'll discuss some key changes of the tax reform that had an impact on you as an individual taxpayer's filing form 1040. We will go over the changes in the tax bracket, Schedule A, the itemized tax deductions, as well as other key changes. As a result of changes made to the withholding tables, you may have found yourself owing taxes that you didn't anticipate with the filing of your 2018 tax returns. In fact, many taxpayers were caught off guard because they thought their refunds would be larger, if anything, because of their overall understanding that the tax rates were lowered. We'll cover why this was the case and introduce you a powerful tool at the end of the session that will help minimize any unwanted surprises with the filing of your 2019 tax returns due in April 2020. For those of you joining today, we're also who are also business owners, will highlight some major changes to you as 1120C corporation owner, S corporation, partnership, single member LLC, or as a sole proprietor filing Schedule C. Then we'll circle back to Fatima to go over the importance of having qualified plans. And last but not least, we'll end the session with some time for your questions. Next. First, the slide in front of you is the individual income tax bracket comparison chart for single filers for tax years 2017 through 2019. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act changed the income tax brackets across the board when it went into effect in January 2018. While the seven tax bracket system was retained, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act reduced the rates and the breakpoint thresholds were adjusted accordingly and the top individual tax rate was lowered from 39.6% to 37%. Next slide will show similar to, um, this page shows the year-to-year -year comparison but for married filing jointly filers. Again, you'll see that overall the bracket got wider and the top tax, top tax bracket is 37%. For estates and trusts, the previous five tax brackets were reduced to only four, and similar to the individual rates, the top tax bracket is now 37%, although as you can see, it doesn't take much taxable income to rise to the top tax rate. The 0%, 15%, and 20% tax rates available for long-term capital gains and qualified dividends retain their same preferred rate. However, the key change here is that the thresholds were adjusted based on the filing status and the taxable income range. 
Prior to tax reform, only individuals whose ordinary income were in 39.6% were subject to the top 20% capital gains and qualified dividend tax rates. The chart shown here reflects 2019 inflation adjusted amount. And in case you're wondering, qualified dividends are dividends paid by a U.S. Corp or qualifying foreign entities from your stocks, mutual funds, or exchange traded funds in your portfolio that you've held for over 60 days. And of course, long-term capital gains are those securities you held for more than a year. I'm sure most of you are aware that you have two methods available to offset your adjust gross income. One is taking a standard deduction, and the other is itemizing your deductions using Schedule A. The tax reform almost doubled the standard deduction. This was a great news for those taxpayers who do not have a complicated tax situation. The tax reform's big push was the agenda that more Americans can simplify their tax filings by taking the generous standard deduction. However, we'll go over how that premise was short-lived a little bit later. As you may already know, the personal exemption has been suspended through tax year 2025. It was much, 4,050 for 2017, and it also phased out at 261,500 for single and 313,800 for mayor filing joint. If you're subjected to alternative minimum tax in the past, AMT for short, you would have missed out on this exemption anyway. Some of you may be wondering, what is AMT? Congress enacted this alternate method to compute income tax liability back in 1969 that operates alongside the regular income tax. For AMT calculation, you have to add back many deductions that you would have been able to, allow, been able to take for regular income tax. It requires some taxpayers to calculate their liability twice, once under the rules of their regular income tax and once under the AMT rules, and you end up paying the higher of the two tax liabilities. It was originally intended to prevent perceived abuses by a handful of ultra-rich. The AMT affected roughly 5 million filers in 2017. However, with the provisions of tax cuts and jobs act, dramatically reducing the reach of AMT, so only about 200,000 filers are slated to be hit with AMT in 2018. The reason for this is because some of the common triggers, such as high personal exemptions and high state and local tax, are no longer available. Well, it's a great news that federal standard deductions went up to a record level. We have to also think about what kind of impact this will have for the state. In general, many states require you to choose the same method of deduction for states as you did for federal. But as you can see on this chart, for Maryland and Virginia, the rates aren't as high as federal. What this means is that depending on your own state standard deduction amount, you may need to step back and consider which method between taking the standard or itemized would give you the better outcome by considering the results for both federal and com state combined. A few things to highlight here is that good news for DC, if you're DC residents, as you can see, the DC rates are in line with federal. For Maryland, the state allows you to elect to use standard deduction to compute Maryland taxable income, whether or not the individual itemized deductions was used on the federal taxable income. However, if you elect to use the standard deduction at the federal level, you must use the standard deduction for state as well. The minimum and the maximum shown on this chart for Maryland, it, that just shows you how Maryland computes its allowable standard deduction. Basically, if your adjusted gross income is low, you can take the minimum, and if your adjusted gross income is high, the standard deduction would be 15% of your Maryland adjusted gross income, not to exceed the maximum shown on the chart. Before we talk about the state and local tax deduction cap of 10,000, I thought you might find this slide interesting. Here's a U.S. map showing all of the state income tax rates for your reference. Please note that some states also impose local taxes as well, which is not reflected here. Take a look at the rates for California, Hawaii, New Jersey, Oregon, and Minnesota, which stand out particularly high, high state rates. Individual income taxes are a major source of state and government revenue, accounting for about 37% of state tax collections. 43 states levy individual income taxes, 41 states tax wage and salary income, while two states, New Hampshire and Tennessee, exclusively tax dividend and interest income. Seven states levy no income tax at all. I'm sure you're very familiar with Florida, but others are Alaska, Nevada, South Dakota, Washington, Wyoming, and Texas. 
We'll be talking about itemized deductions here. So think back to the last few weeks of December 2017. Do you remember seeing news coverage of many folks lined up in their local county offices desperately trying to prepay their real estate taxes so they can claim the deduction in 2017 rather than being limited in 2018? The county offices all over the U.S. even extended their office hours to accommodate all the people, but as we all know, the IRS soon put taxpayers and tax professionals on notice that this prepayment of estimated 2018 property tax would not be allowed as a deduction unless your county had already assessed your 2018 real estate taxes before end of 2017. The tax reform capped the sum of the income tax or sales tax, you can only take one of the two, real estate tax and personal property taxes to combination of 10,000. And of course, this hurt many folks living in high income or property tax jurisdiction. Please note that this limitation does not apply to real property taxes and personal property taxes paid or accrued in carrying on a trade or business. For example, your rental activity reported on Schedule E. Prior to tax reform, you were permitted to deduct mortgage interest up to $1 million of acquisition debt for Marifal and Joint. But any new debt incurred on or after December 15, 2017 is now limited to $750,000 for Marifal and Joint filers. Debt incurred on or before December 15, 2017 is grandfathered under the previous law and still allowed to deduct interest on debt up to $1 million. So basically, if you've been deducting mortgage interest up to a million before 2018, you can continue to deduct the same. Home equity line of credit is no longer deductible unless the proceeds were used to acquire and do major improvements to your home. I know in prior years, many taxpayers took out the equity line of credit to pay off personal credit card debt or pay for kids' college tuition, et cetera, but you can no longer deduct interest associated with them. If you used a portion of the HELOC loan for major improvements and some to pay off personal debt, then you would need to apply what's called interest tracing rules in order to identify the amount that would be tax deductible. Last point on this slide, miscellaneous item deduction is subject to 2% and the casualty losses are suspended through 2025. The, um, the examples of the itemized deduction subject to 2%, those who would include investment management fees, tax preparation fees, and unreimbursed employee expenses. I was surprised to find that some taxpayers were under the impression that their charitable contributions were no longer deductible. The truth is that tax reform actually increased the amount of your cash donations up from 50% to 60% limit of your adjusted gross income. As such, one very easy tax planning tip you can put to use right away is on charitable contributions. Since the amount of the standard tax deduction is very generous now, you might want to consider bunching donations into one year so that you can claim higher deductions in one year and then take standard deductions in other years. You can switch from taking standard versus itemized back and forth. So, so a lot of people are utilizing this tip. Let's go over the example. A married taxpayer traditionally makes $7,000 of charitable contributions a year and has a real estate taxes of 10,000. Following the tax reform, the taxpayer will take the standard deduction of 24,400, that's the 2019 level. However, if the taxpayer bunches four years worth of charitable contributions into a single year, the taxpayer will be better off itemizing that year. And one of the ways you can do this is that you can also open up what's considered um, what's called donor advice fund, and you can bunch the charitable contribution into a single year, tax, take the tax write-off in the initial year of the contribution, and you can take as long as you want to distribute the funds out of that into succeeding years. Parents or guardians with qualifying income can claim the child tax credit for each of their dependent children. And this is going to bring a smile to many of your faces because more people can now benefit from it. While personal exemptions were taken away, the tax reform expanded the credit in terms of eligible taxpayers and eligible dependents. And not only that, the amount of credit doubled to 2000 and the refundable credit also increased. But first, you have to know who your qualifying child is. And there are several tests for this. First, there's a relationship test. 
It has to be your child or descendant of your child, sibling or step-sibling, or descendants of the sibling or step-sibling. There is the abode test requiring the individual to have that same principal place of residence as the taxpayer for more than half the year. There's a support test looking to see if the qualifying child provided over half of his or her own support for the calendar year. And must be age 17, under age 17 in order to qualify for the credit, or it can be any age if permanently or totally disabled. It must be a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident alien. In the past, the child tax credit has been only available for low to middle income households. For instance, the credit began to disappear in 2017 for married couples who earn more than 110,000 and for single filers with a just gross income above 75,000. In 2018, the credit was available far more to far more households and the new phase out started at a just gross income of 400,000, which is significant, and 200,000 for other filers. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act raised the eligibility bar for qualifying children, but now requires social security number for the child in order to claim the $2,000 credit. In the past, taxpayer identification number was sufficient. Other changes we want to talk about, first we'll talk about the dependent credit. Perhaps the most surprising change to the dependent-related credit is the addition of a $500 credit for each dependent who does not satisfy the definition of a qualifying child. This new credit is available for qualifying relatives, but also for qualifying children who are not eligible for the $2,000 credit we just talked about. For this credit, the qualifying children include those ages 17 and 18 or up through age 23 for full-time students and, age, and any age for children who are totally and permanently disabled. The $500 credit is available for individuals without social security number as long as they have a taxpayer identification number and meet other dependency tests. Lastly, none of the $500 is refundable, meaning it can only offset your tax liability. Qualifying relative is a person who has lived with you for the entire year. He or she does not have to be related to you by blood or marriage. And if the person doesn't live with you for the entire year, then you would look into the nature of their relationship. For 529 college savings plans, the tax reform expanded the definition of qualified higher education expenses to include up to 100 I'm sorry, to 10,000 of expenses pay for tuition to elementary or secondary public, private, or religious school. The limitations on a per student basis, not per account. The penalty for failing to maintain minimal essential health coverage is gone after December 31, 2018. And lastly, it's surprising that it took this long, but if your child has unfortunately died or has become disabled, the cancellation of their student debt is no longer considered taxable income. Children that are subject to the kitty tax have different tax regimes for their earned and unearned income. Children will now be able to file their returns in April rather than having to wait for their parents' return to be finalized. For earned income, it will be taxed at the rate of single filer and the earned income will be taxed at the ordinary income and preferential rates that apply to the trust and estate. If there's one lesson learned from 2018 tax season is that it's worth re that it's worth repeating for those of us who get W-2 wages is that we all need to check withholdings. And as I talked about before, many people are surprised that they were short or that their refunds were smaller or that they in fact pay, had to pay tax balance with the filing of their 2018. And it was mainly because with the withholding rate going down, they were actually bringing home more and a net pay than previously, but the amount wasn't that material, so probably nobody noticed. But per paycheck, it made enough difference that overall you ended up having paid less withholdings than in the past. The, death, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 caused quite a start for many taxpayers because of this. With all the changes to tax rates, deductions, credits, and payroll withholdings, as I mentioned before, many of you are caught off guard. So it, it's necessary that we need to review our withholdings, and we need to do it now. The more time you have to make the adjustment, you will be better off. 
If you've already filed your tax return, now is an ideal time to analyze your tax situation and ensure that your withholding will be sufficiently cover your 2019 tax liability. You don't want to blindly overwithhold, since that just means you're giving the IRS interest-free loan. In addition, you may miss out on opportunities to do something more impactful with the money, such as investing, or perhaps it means better cash flow for your family if you're bringing that money home. And we all know this. I'm sure this is not the first time you heard it. But the big question is, how much will be enough? You will be happy to know that the IRS has a withholding tool available at your fingertips. All you would need is a prior tax return and your year-to-date pay stub to see if you're currently withholding enough or if you're under withholding. There's no need to input personal information, meaning your name or social security number and any other personal data is not required to use this tool. Also, the IRS doesn't keep track of any information you enter, so you can utilize this tool as often as you like and run multiple scenarios. You just need to go to www.irs.gov and under the pay, click on tax withholding as shown on the screen. Then you just need to answer the question on the interactive tool and it will guide you through each step. Once you're done answering all the questions, you'll get a result some, like something that you see on the screen. This is a, uh, from a demonstration I did back in 2018, but the fundamentals haven't changed. Based on the numbers you enter, the tool will give you a summary in layman terms what the recommended steps are to minimize your surprises in April 2020. If after checking with the IRS withholding calculator, you find out that you need to adjust your withholdings, you would need to file Form W-4 shown here and submit to your employer to adjust your withholding. You can do it with a number or you can even just withhold a certain dollar amount. And a similar withholding form for your resident state may be needed as well. One thing I'd like to point out here is that most people have some investment income and capital gains to report. And for these, there are no withholdings being taken out. So one option would be to increase your W-2 withholding to cover not only your wages, but also for additional reportable income. The other option would be to make quarterly estimated tax payments throughout the year. But most times, clients find that just adjusting their withholdings, maybe through a bonus or at year end, is better option for them instead of having to remember the quarterly estimated tax payment deadline. So why is a big deal about under withholding? Nobody wants to be surprised in April. There's nothing wrong with having too much paid in. In fact, I know some folks who look forward to getting a fat refund check with the filing of the returns. However, if you find that you underwithheld and all of a sudden you need to come out with a sizable cash to pay the taxes, it can be very stressful. If you find yourself in a situation where the return was filed but you didn't have the money to pay the taxes due, just remember to be proactive and not wait for IRS to contact you. As long as you keep the communication line open, you may be able to avoid levy notices. And the IRS agents are people just like us, doing their job. And they understand sometimes life happens and you find yourself in a bad place. And they will be more than happy to work with you. And you want to make sure that you're not under withheld for any, some of the penalties that you may, be, you may be subject to. I hope you now have a good understanding of the changes that were implemented by the tax reform for individual taxpayers. As we look forward to the tax year 2019 filing season, which by the way, will be here before we know it, I wanted to wrap up this portion by mentioning a few things you can look forward to with the next year's tax filings. Of course, we all know that nothing stays stagnant in the tax world. For starters, the IRS is currently working on updating 2019 Form 1040 to modify based on the feedback they receive from the taxpayers and practitioners. To appreciate the change, you may you have to know where we started. So in front of you is something sim very familiar. This is the 2017 Tax Form 1040. It had over 79 lines, and if you had a decent amount of investment income, you would have been required to file Schedule A for itemized deductions, Schedule B for interest and dividend income,
Schedule C if you had business activity and Schedule D for stock sales. And if you had a rental income, you would have to also file Schedule E, as well as any K-1s that would go on Schedule E as well. With the tax reform, a postcard size Form 1040 was introduced. And when you look at the form in front of you, and it does look much shorter, doesn't it? It looks simple and nice and short. But in addition to schedules A, B, C, D, and E that we just discussed, tax reform introduced additional six schedules that were numbered from one through six as part of the individual tax form that had to be filed if you met the requirement. Working with the new form, many taxpayers and practitioners found the flow of information counterintuitive and additional schedules, schedules very burdensome. If you truly have a very simple tax situation, you may have been able to file your tax return just using these two pages. But I don't know any of those folks personally, and I'm sure none of them have joined us today. I think if you had a W-2, then you could file it just using these two pages. Voila, this is the draft 2019 form. You can see that the signature lines have been moved back to the second page, just like 2017 tax form. And the lines have been updated based on the many feedback they received. Also, rather than schedules one through six, we will only have three schedules. This is in draft, so it remains to be seen what the final version will look like, but I thought you might want to take a look, take a peek into the new form. We'll now shift focus to some of the changes of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act you need to be aware of on the business side. First, the 199 CAFE deduction. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act slashed C Corporation tax rate from 35% to a flat 21%. This is a big cut and very welcome news for sure. However, for business owners who operate in a pass-through structure, such as Schedule C, partnership, as corporations, their flow-through income would be, could be subject to the top, top tax bracket of 37%, and the lawmakers knew that would not be received well. As a result, the Section 109 Cap A deduction was introduced to somehow equalize somewhat between the C Corp filer who are paying 21% versus individual tax filers with flow-through income who may be subject to a higher tax rate. To give you a very high level overview, the 199 CAFE deduction is a 20% deduction on your qualified business income portion of your pass-through income. The computation to arrive at qualified business income, I call it QBI for short, is very complex. And you don't really fully know what that 20% deduction will be until you get to the owner's level because the deduction is taken at the individual level. And there are many, many other factors that need to be considered, such as the type of trade or business you operate, W-2 wages of the company, and the qualified property attributable to qualified business income, as well as the individual's adjusted gross income. Well, we don't have the time to get into the mechanics of computing the deduction. Please note that 20% deduction does not reduce your business income or adjusted gross income. It's just taken into account to arrive at your taxable income. When the word got out about this new deduction, we had numerous conversations with our business clients who suddenly wondered if they should convert their businesses from their current structure to a C-Corp. Like every individual tax situation is different, there was no one-size-fits-all answer when it comes to this question. We had to actually run computations and consider some unique aspects of a C-Corp in order to provide our clients with the net impact. For most, the benefit of converting their pass-through activity to a C-Corp wasn't large enough to do so, but we also found that in certain cases, it made sense. Again, every business is different, so if you are a business owner, I recommend having an in-depth discussion with your tax professionals if you haven't done so already. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 made very significant changes to the taxation of employers unqualified transportation fringe benefits offered to its employees. With tax reform, it is generally disallowed now, unless it is taxable to the employee. Parking provided on a pre-tax basis to employees under salary reduction is not deductible. Under previous law, payment or reimbursement of an employee's qualified moving expenses 
were not subject to income or employment taxes. With tax reform, employers must include all moving expenses and employees' wages, subject to income and employment taxes, unless you are in the U.S. Armed Forces moving person to a military order and incident to a permanent change of station. Entertainment costs. This is of particular interest for business owners. Entertainment costs are no longer deductible, such as golf, sports, or theater expenses used to entertain customers. The cost of the package that includes a ticket to a charitable sporting event will, all, will be also non-deductible, although any charitable donation portion will continue to be deductible. The 50% business meals are still deductible. Food during entertainment can qualify as a, serve, as a business deduction if purchased separately from the entertainment portion. In addition, cost of occasional holiday parties or picnics Department gatherings and outings continue to be fully deductible as long as the expenses incurred primarily benefit all employees other than those who are just highly compensated. Cost of meals incurred by employees for business luncheons or while traveling on company business, as long as not lavish or extravagant, will continue to be deductible but limited to 50% of the cost, same as before. Prior to 2000. 17 tax reform, you are allowed to take back, take current year net operating loss and carry back two years and carry forward 20 years. The new rule is that net operating loss created after December 31, 2017 can no longer be carried back, other than certain losses incurred in the trade or business of farming. Now you can only carry forward indefinitely, and it is capped at 80% of taxable income and it will be 90% after year 2022. What this means is that you will at least owe taxes on the 20% that will not be wiped out by the carry forward net operating law. For any NOL that was created prior to the change that you carry forward, the rule, the old rule still applies. So if you have pre-2018 NOL carry forward, it can fully offset your taxable income in future years. Unlike kind exchanges, tax-free treatment of exchanges are now limited to realty. The last piece of the major impact on business that I would like to cover is the interest deduction limitation, often called 163J limitation. This interest deduction limitation generally applies to business interest expense of U.S. taxpayers engaged in any form of business. And as you can see, it is limited to the sum of the business income, 30% of taxpayers' adjusted taxable income, or taxpayers' floor plan financing interest for tax year. A taxpayer could be exempt from the Section 163J rules if the business's average annual gross receipts for the three preceding taxable years do not exceed $25 million. I've now reached the end of my portion of the presentation, and I thank everyone for keeping up with me as we covered a lot. But Fatima will now discuss a very important message on qualified plans. Thank you, Kay. So we've gone over a lot of changes in the tax code in recent months, but one thing is that we have not changed. Um, it's actually the value of having a tax advantaged or qualified plan for self-employed and small business owners. So qualified retirement plans can be a source of big tax savings. This chart shows the potential taxes paid under three different retirement plan options. In this example, a 50-year-old self-employed professional with an annual income of $350,000 can potentially cut his tax bill by almost $50,000 per year with a defined benefit plan and more than $75,000 per year if they combine both a defined benefit plan and a 401k plan. So in both cases, he's also saving nearly $200,000 or more for retirement. There are many ways that you can structure your qualified plan. Um, and of course, they don't have to cost a lot. Costs have also dropped over the years. So now is a good time to think about getting started. And it's also important to remember that the lower tax bill and rapid wealth accumulation that go along with a, a qualified plan, and those benefits can really outweigh the costs, actually by a lot. So to, to illustrate this, let's go through an example. In this example, Dr. Jamil earns $325,000 per year. Now he wants to reduce his tax bill, and, tax bill and build a large retirement account quickly so he can retire in the next 10 years. 
He'd also like to offer his employees a retirement savings plan to reduce turnover in his office. So Dr. Jamil opens a cash balance plan that also has a safe harbor 401k and profit sharing plan combined. He decides that he can contribute a total of $195,000 for himself, $170,000 of which will go to his cash balance plan and $25,000 to the 401k profit sharing plan. Now he'll also have to make some contributions for his employees. And for his employees, he contributes almost $10,000 in total, divided between the cash balance plan and the 401k profit sharing plan. So with this combination, he's able to reduce his taxes by more than $68,000 per year, and the value of his retirement plans could actually reach almost 2.6 million in 10 years. So this is just one example of the value of having a qualified plan. And of course, regardless of the recent tax law changes. So now we'd like to begin the question and answer portion of today's webinar. If you have any questions for Kay, please send it to us using the control panel on GoToWebinar. There's a chat feature there um, where you can type in your question and we'll be happy to take it. So Kay, I would like to kind of start out with a question um, to learn a little bit more about the um, 199A deduction. Um, oftentimes companies will provide consulting work to their customers. Um, are they able to take advantage of that 20% deduction? Thank you, Fatima. This is a very common question that we're bombarded during year and tax planning, as well as when we were pre uh, preparing 2018 business returns in early spring. So there was a time when consulting was a catch-all word for many business activities. And it is now, I mean, it was used very loosely. If you did any kind of personal services, they call themselves a consultant. And a lot of the websites would say consulting something something. And now with a 20% deduction on the line through tax year 2025, if you haven't already done so, it's a very good time to evaluate exactly what you do and what kind of services are being provided to your customers. Because there's a chance that even though up to this point you called yourself a consultant and your business maybe you say, you know, we offer a very variety of consulting services, maybe there's a section within your business line that may not be straightforward consulting. Um, and the, the importance of dissecting your business into this level is because consulting in the traditional term will no long, will not be able to be eligible for the 20% deduction, but other types of business activities are. And that's why it's important before you immediately say, well, I'm a consultant and therefore I probably will not be eligible for the 20% deduction, it is now a really good time to have a discussion with your tax advisor. Now, that's actually really interesting. Even we had a lot of experience with a lot of our small business owners, um, especially physicians, um, who were also asking, you know, whether they, you know, they would qualify for this deduction. So it's interesting to learn, you know, that it, it is very, it is for a specified group of business owners, um, not necessarily applied to everyone. Exactly. And to go even further, many clients use their business name as ABC Consulting. Some of them even went as far as changing their name <laughs> so that the consulting world would know or be found. Um, I think the idea was that they felt the IRS would run some kind of data mine. And if there was a word consulting found, then they may be at risk. So mm -hmm. many people were, you know, even though a pre, you know, leading to um, before 2010, 17 tax reform, it really didn't matter. And nobody really, everybody sort of knew when you're a consultant, oh, okay, you're a consultant, and then we left it at that. But now people are taking their time to what should we name ourselves? How should we, you know, what kind of business model should we have? It's all a very thought out process. So going back to this 20% deduction, does it apply to all of the business profit? Um, that's a very good question, too, and no. The answer is that 20% deduction is only available on what's called qualified business income. And oftentimes, you see people mention it as a QBI for short. It's common for a company to have one core business, be it consulting or augmentation. Some business may have multiple lines of trade or business under one umbrella without really knowing it. For example, one company may have a division that does consulting, one for augmentation, one for building customized software. It may not be the, the major part of their business, but they may have a small segment of it. In this case, the qualified business income is determined separately for each identified trade or business. 
In identifying whether or not you would have you have a multiple trader business, we generally recommend our clients to look at their contracts and see if the revenue being generated under that one contract, if there is one activity or multiple activities are being done. And the idea is that more activities you can carve out as non-consulting, the better your chances of increasing the 1.9 and CAPA deduction. And also, if you keep separate books for each division, it strengthens your position to take the deduction in case of an audit. Okay, so can you give us a little bit, a bit of better idea, like what exactly is a qualified trader business? Yes, and this is something that I think a lot of the practitioners were trying to understand because even though the, you know, a lot of we were looking through the actual definition, I think it was really hard for us to grasp. So I think it would be easier to understand if we discuss what is not qualified business income. A, Trader business conducted by a C Corp is not QBI. And of course, we know by what we just discussed that C Corps are taxed at 20%. There's no, it's not a flow through, so it's not considered to be a QBI. If you provide service as an employee, you're not, it's not considered to be a QBI income. And then there's this big group called Specified Service Trades of Business, SSTB for short. SSTB is a trader business involving the following. It involves performing services in the fields of health, law, accounting, actuarial science, performing arts, consulting, there you go, athletics, financial services, investing, and investment management, trading, and any trade or business where the principal asset is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees or owners. But there is an exception to this broad description too, depending on whether you influence the decisions made by the client. Also, even if you are SSTB, you may be eligible to take the 20% deduction if your adjust gross income falls within certain thresholds. So it's best to have an in-depth discussion with your tax advisor. Yeah, and I think that really um, kind of hits out of a lot of our clients were questions our clients were having, um, you know, whether their business would fall into this, whether the, their adjusted gross income would allow them to take advantage of this. So that's some great advice. Um, people should definitely be talking to their tax advisors about their personal situations. Right. Um, and, and, and lastly, how do S corporations and partnerships handle the um, 199A deduction on a qualified business income? This was another area when when we were preparing the S Corp and partnership returns in early spring. Um, I can't really say that the rules were clear back then, but you know we just we had our national tax office give us some guidance and um, and now we we know a little more than what we knew back in the spring and it was a little bit late, but I guess better late than never. The S corporations and the partnerships are pass through entities and therefore they do not pay taxes at the entity level. However, the K-1s that's been generated within the S-Corp and the partnership, that will have the shareholders or partner share of qualified business income items. And it would also reflect W-2 wages on adjusted basis immediately after acquisition. It's called UBIA for short of qualified property. Qualified REIT dividends that may also be eligible for the 199 cap A deduction. And qualified publicly traded partnership, PTP. Um, income items. And all of these are reflected on the K-1. It's in box 20. And for those of you listening today, if you have a K-1 coming through from investment or from or trade or business, you'll see that there is more information on 2018 K-1 than ever before. There will be a lot of footnotes, a lot of coding, and that is as a result of um, needing all this information. So at the individual level, you have all the information to make an accurate calculation. Well, thank you, Kay. This was a lot of great information. And maybe just one last question in terms of practical information or advice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any resources where people can go to keep up to date? Um, I know, uh, you know, going to their accountant is a great place, but um, what would you recommend as kind of a way for people to kind of understand or are there any good resources that you know, or is it really just best to go and talk to your tax professional? Well, I do know that because of a lot of the speculations and predictions that were there, I know that if you were to just do a Google search, you'll get a plethora of information out there. But you don't want to just pick random things because, you know, it may be outdated information or superseded information. There were some technical corrections that came out after the, the law was passed. So I think it is best to 
talk to your advisor. Because what sometimes we see is that some our clients who random, randomly call us and they say, hey, I heard so-and-so, um, somebody told me that this is it. Is this true? And that may be true for that taxpayer, but it may not apply to you. So in most cases, I do think that it'd be best to talk to your individual tax advisor only because they know your history, they know what kind of incomes you're expecting. And I think instead of trying to kind of pick and choose some of the, you know, information that's out there, I think you will be well served talking to one individual who is up to date with all the laws and ch changes, and then they can give you the relevant information so that you can make informed decisions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Um, with that, we will conclude today's presentation. We appreciate our speaker joining us as well as um, all of our participants. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, thank you everyone.